All right, guys, thank you for that update. We'll talk to you guys a little bit more coming up in just a few minutes. Right now, we're going to welcome the armchair attorney, Matthew Leffler, to the show. And Matt, you're here with us, and you're participating in Fun Shirt Friday. I've got to say, I like the shirt. <laughs> We got to get ready to relax. The weekend is upon us. I'm excited. Thank you for having me here. So let's dig into the topic at hand, a little bit about what's going on with the Supreme Court decision with C.H. Robinson, kind of the warning flags that it's throwing up to the industry. First thing, kind of give us an overview about the case and then the decision that was made. Let me just say, I love Ryan Schreiber, but he had an article recently. I want to talk a little bit about this C.H. Robinson case. This is all about potential broker liability for the negligent or alleged negligent hiring of a carrier. The facts of this case are really sad. Costco hired C.H. Robinson to go move some freight. C.H. Robinson hired a company called RT Service. The driver for RT Service lost control of his vehicle, crossed the center line, collided head on with the person who was ultimately injured and became a quadriplegic. That, that that plaintiff then sued uh, to try and get some compensation from C.H. Robinson, among others. And at the district level, the lowest court, he actually lost. And it went to the, the, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And the Ninth Circuit said, actually, there is a path for you to recover. The This act that we're talking about, the Federal Aviation Authorization Act, or F-A-A-A-A, uh, doesn't actually prohibit you from making those claims. That was then brought to the Supreme Court. They asked for the Supreme Court to take a look at it. They do a thing called the writ for certiorari. And the Supreme Court didn't respond. They denied the writ for certiorari, and there's a lot of reasons we'll get into, but that is, at its core, the foundations of this case. Are brokers potentially liable for the alleged negligent hiring of their driver partners? And Matthew, when you look at this case, do you see this potentially kind of setting a precedent potentially for other cases outside of this transaction? That's the real question. So one of the reasons why the Supreme Court would hear a case is whether or not it's been a, a dispute among the different circuits. And this is a case we call a first impression, meaning no one's ever brought a claim about wrongful hiring under the this particular part of the statute, which is uh, this 14501C, which is the preemption that covers price, route, and service. The, the act itself has this carve out for safety regulations, and that's what the Supreme Court likely was thinking about. In terms of what will happen next, uh, there will be more litigation. Uh, this is not new. I want to be very clear here. The idea that you can go after a broker for negligently hiring a carrier is not a new phenomenon. This is why the Supreme Court didn't jump in and say, we have to settle this dispute. These cases will continue to happen. And this is something for brokers. And Ryan does a great job in his article telling you, you should be talking to your attorneys now, understanding what potential liability you have as you look to vet your carrier partners. So obviously, when it comes to carrier vetting, a lot of that onus is on the individual broker itself, but there's only so much that they can do, right? If you've got a carrier who is maybe, let's let's use a mid-sized carrier, they've got a good reputation, maybe not a great reputation. They've had a couple of issues, but nothing that's major. Your gut is going to say, you know what, I think I trust them, let's go with them. And you can't necessarily rely on a full reputation, right? A driver could be having a bad day. It could just be this kind of one-off situation. And a lot of that falls back on the broker, but at the same time, it doesn't. So should this be looked at as kind of a case-by-case -case basis instead of maybe setting precedent? Because at the end of the day, like, we're all human, right? Like, drivers have a bad day. I know I have bad days. Anthony probably has bad days, but I doubt it. But, like, it's it happens, right? Not everybody's going to be perfect 100% of the time. You're 100% right. This is about a case-by-case -case basis because it's about negligence, ultimately, is what is your duty to do a certain activity when you're hiring a company? So you have to have processes. You have to have technology partners that can help you figure out, is this carrier the one they purport to be? And at the end of the day, the thing to keep in mind is FMCSA, the safety regulations, these are minimum standards of our industry. States have every right, and they do, include higher levels of uh, regulatory safety statutes or safety common law. So if you're trying to avoid liability and to understand what you're up against, you want to make sure your carriers have adequate insurance. You want to make sure that you're talking and verifying all the different aspects of their business. And if you can, get references. But again, none of this is meant as legal advice. If you're a broker, you're trying to understand your liability, talk to attorneys in your state because these are state-specific things. As of right now, the FAAA does not prohibit or exempt you from a liability under this uh, this preemption doctrine. It is the safety things are still going to be there. These claims will still be there. And if the different circuits over the next few years adopt different positions on this statute, then we might go to the Supreme Court. But I think we're not going to have SCOTUS. They're not going to help us. They're not going to save us in this case. You have to be proactive in how you vet your carriers.
I think one of the things you mentioned, of course, was insurance costs. Would this potentially start to impact, depending on how it plays out, insurance costs for brokers and ultimately shippers? Absolutely. Uh, so a couple of things to note, like we have this thing called the nuclear verdict. That is a pretend legal term. It's not a legal term. Um, the DOT actually has a number for the valuation of human life at $11.2 million. A nuclear verdict means a case that's over $10 million. Anytime someone dies or has a catastrophic injury, it will be over $10 million, probably. And so what we look at is terms like the insurance piece of this. And this is why the states have these regulatory regimes. This carrier, the RT service that, uh, that made someone a quadriplegic, my guess is they don't have the insurance to cover all of those things. And so as a plaintiff, you're looking and saying, well, who has pockets? Who can I go after? Who has the ability to make me whole? And these brokers are usually the ones that have insulated themselves from liability. But I think that they will see an increase in their insurance rates. And maybe as time goes on, the FMCSA may come out and say, we demand carriers to have higher levels of coverage. And if the higher level of coverage is something, that will also increase your overall cost of insurance. With that cost of insurance, obviously it impacts those smaller to mid-sized carriers more than it does those really large fleets. But sometimes often, as we were talking about earlier this week, those larger fleets are the ones that can kind of skirt underneath the regulations where they don't have drivers who are completely vetted or completely trained because there are just so many people involved in their organization. So how do we find that balance if it exists between putting the onus on the broker on the larger carrier and also not making it so expensive with just blanket rates for the entire, I guess, kind of carrier network or carrier ethos that it runs those little guys who can't afford it out of business? This is a great question. This is one of the hallmarks, and the, and the case actually talks a little bit about deregulation for the 1980s. Uh, this is a big challenge of the industry. So if you're a big carrier, you may even self-insure up to a certain dollar amount. So you don't even care if it's under $5 million because you're going to pay that out of pocket. You have the margins to support that. For the small carriers, their, their limits, their, what they're supposed to carry minimum in some cases, is $750,000. That's barely enough to handle someone who breaks an arm or a leg in the modern world of medical uh, you know, cases when you go to the hospital. So I don't know the answer to this. I think what we're going to find is at the end of the day, states want to make sure that if somebody in some chain of custody of some deal is responsible for some catastrophic accident, it shouldn't be the taxpayers in the state that have to take up that burden through emergency services or other types of ways of forgiving medical debt. In our country, the biggest form of bankruptcy is medical debt. So this is a really big issue. I don't know the answer. I think for small carriers, you're nimble and you're able to compete at a lower rate in some cases, but that may change as insurance changes and in how we look at liability for carriers and for brokers. So Matt, last question for you, and this is going to pick on lawyers a little bit, but not specifically your type of lawyer. I'm thinking of the lawyers who come through and, you know, they're the commercials that you see that say, if you've been injured in a motor vehicle accident by an 18 wheeler, like I'm going to fight for your money, right? Where do they sit in these types of situations like this? Are they continually oh, I just... Love, <laughs> I love this question. I love this question. They are brokers. So when you have a TV commercial lawyer, maybe, maybe they're going to litigate that case. But reality is you call them. And then they say, I'm taking in you as a client and I'm going to refer you to somebody else. And they get typically one third of that attorney's one third. So in the law business, we broker all the time. So for these guys that are out there uh, doing this uh, commercial or thing, that that's kind of what they do. But at the end of the day, most people who are in a catastrophic accident do not know who to call. They don't know what they're supposed to do because you don't plan for catastrophic events. And so a plaintiff's attorney is somebody who's designed and trained and, and practices in going after after people that are well more funded than you. And keep in mind, as a plaintiff attorney, you do not get paid unless you win something. So if you go to court and you lose, you don't get anything except for maybe the court costs. Like maybe your client will pay for the filing fees. So it's a really interesting business as a plaintiff's attorney. For the defense attorneys, the same kind of thing happens. They're generally representing insurance companies. Now, occasionally they work with the company directly and they, and they will as a client, but they're working with the insurers who are having to pay out these massive amounts of money. And medical... Uh, transactions. These are expensive things. When you get really injured, it's not cheap. It can be $50,000 a day in a hospital. So the lawyers out there, um, I love them. I love Ryan Schreiber. He's a good dude. I think what he's doing at Metaphor is amazing. Uh, but I think with his article and talking about C.H. Robinson changing the way the business works, I don't think it's that way. I think this is just showing us and reminding us what the stakes actually are in our industry. Matthew, excellent. As always, thank you so much for being here and breaking down the situation. We look forward to having you on again. I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much, guys. Great to see you both.
All right, guys, take care. And of course, you can find Matt on LinkedIn, the armchair attorney, for more non-official, non-solicited legal advice. Right now, we're going to take another quick break, and we'll be right back in just a few minutes.